This is Thursday, August 18, 2016. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Joseph Keefe. Welcome, Joe. My pleasure to be here. May I ask when you were born? on September the 12th, 1931. And where were you born? Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And what community do you currently live? Right here in Natick. Your marital status? I'm married and will have been married in another month for 60 years. Congratulations. Do you have children? Three grown daughters and four grown granddaughters at this stage in the game. They'll all be in colleges of next week. <laughs> I understand that you actually grew up in Cumberland, Rhode Island. That's right. And tell us a little bit about that. During my boyhood, Cumberland had a population probably of about eight or 9,000. It was primarily a farming community. Subsequent to the Second World War, the farms met their demise to be replaced by housing plots, primarily for returning veterans. And that was the beginning of, of the baby boom in that town, which now has a population, I understand, of about 30,000. And what did your parents do for a living? My father was an auditor for the state of Rhode Island, and my mother was a stay-at-home mother. And did you have any brothers or sisters? One brother and one sister. What do you remember about the Great Depression? Well, I'll, I think one of the, the things that has given me a lasting memory is that at Christmas time, my mother would take potatoes, raw potatoes, and she would insert dimes and quarters into them and put them into the stocking. Now, if you received a nickel in those days, they'd bought a good size Hershey bar, probably twice the size of the one that you'd find today. If you received a quarter, you thought you were wealthy. So it was very appropriate at the Christmas holiday <laughs> to get a couple of quarters. And uh, what schools did you go to? I went to the Berkeley Grammar School that began in grade one through grade eight in four rooms. And then I graduated from Cumberland High School in 1948. Let's get back to 1941. And what were you doing on December 7th of that year? On December the 7th, 1941, I was 10 years old in the fifth, fifth grade at the Berkeley Grammar School. I was sitting in our kitchen in a rocking chair beside the radio, listening to the New York Philharmonic, and a re an announcer broke in and announced that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. That's all they knew at that point in time. Were you or any of your friends or family aware of what had happened? Uh, did you even know where Pearl Harbor was? I'm not certain that I can honestly respond to that question. Mm -hmm. Certainly within a couple of days, we all knew, and that was the talk of the school and the talk of the community, obviously. And one has to recall that we only had the radio. There was no television at that point in time, so you depended heavily on the rather infrequent news broadcasts, unlike the, your 24-hour-a-day TV, TV today. When the United States declared war, did any of your family or friends or t even teachers join the military? One of my uncles was in the OSS. I know that he had par was parachuted into Italy sometime probably in 44. I know that for a fact. Another uncle was a member of the Rhode Island National Guard and he was activated for a period of time and then was very active during all of the period that the war lasted in some form or other with the natural guard. Did the uncle in the OSS survive? Yes, he was a graduate of the University of Notre Dame in 1938. And what about the, uh, the home front years? Do you remember things like victory gardens, scrap drives? Shortly, I wanna say sometime in the spring, of 1942, on a Saturday, 
all of the families had to go to the Berkeley School to the classroom to which we were assigned. And there the teacher was responsible for signing up the family with ration books. We also used the schoolyard for the periodic collection of rubber tires and metal of different types, pots, pans, whatever trash metal, I guess you could use that expression, one could find, you would bring it to the schoolyard and it would be subsequently picked up. Tell us a little more about ration books. The ration books allowed you to purchase meat and certain types of canned goods, sugar, butter, sugar was rationed, butter was rationed. Those are the two things that I remember most completely because my mother would go down to the city, down to Pawtucket, and stand in line at Kennedy's Butter and Egg Store on a Saturday to get a quarter of a pound of butter. How long would that last you? Well, we also substituted uh, for butter various types of margarine with a, uh, it was almost like a chemical mix. Mm. It, it looked like lard and then you had this orange material that you mixed with it and it turned a bright orange. It's when I learned not to use butter. I seldom use butter today. I've spent my whole life simply because we learned how to go without it. In addition, I don't use sugar, and I have never used sugar since the Second World War. Interesting. Just coincidentally. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. That's okay. Uh, what else do you remember about life in Cumberland? I mean, you said you grew up in a farming community, so you had to have vegetables and stuff. Vegetables were easy to get. Fresh mm -hmm. vegetables, particularly in the summer, those were very, very easy to get. The thing that, things that you noticed was, were associated with one's ability to use an automobile. There were three levels of stickers, A, B, and C. C was the sticker that gave you the least amount of gasoline per week, X number of gallons. Mm -hmm. If you had an A sticker, then you were allotted a lot more. That was usually segregated for police and fire and other officials, etc. And what about uh, recreation? What do you remember about that? For example, going to the movies. On Friday night, my father would take us to the Roosevelt Theater in Valley Falls, which was a village in Cumberland. And there we would sit always in the back row and we would watch First, some cereal, and by cereal I mean there was a segment of a program, usually a cowboy story or a detective story, and the idea was to bring you back the following week so you'd see part two or part 12, whatever it may be. And I think it probably cost 25 or 35 cents to get into the film at that point in time. And what do you remember about um, hearing about the war news? You mentioned the radio. Did you also get it from newspapers? Yes, we, were, we subscribed to the Pawtucket Times, which is still in existence. And did you see the war news on newsreels while you were at the theater? Periodically, you would have official War Department films that would be shown as like 10 minutes, they would run probably 10 minutes in length, and they would, you, you never saw anything that was negative in the sense of our men being killed or damaged to our ships or things of that nature. It was always very positive type, positive type film. And how about bond drives? We had in the schools, we had little books and we purchased saving stamps and they cost 10 cents a piece. And whatever the day of the week was, 
we would bring whatever money we were given and the teacher would sell us the stamps and they would be pasted in your book. And when you, re when you had acquired $18 worth of stamps, you turn that in, turn, the, you turn in the book, <coughs> excuse me, and eventually you would get a bond, an actual bond. Okay. Joe, did you work uh, during the war years? I started to work in 1944 at age 13. Because I was as tall then as I am now, <coughs> excuse me, I went down to the post office in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and I told the man that I was 14 and simply made myself a year older. And then I went to the First National in Valley Falls, and I obtained a job working in the First National from the manager, Larry Asino, who had recently been discharged from the Army because he had been injured. And I earned 75 cents an hour. And each month paid $1.75 to the Amalgamated Meat Cutters and Butcher Workers of North America, Local 328, because you had to belong to the that union mm -hmm. in order to be employed. What did you do at the First National? Stock shelves, ran the cash register, clean cases. You did whatever the boss told you to do. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about the Normandy invasion? Nothing other than mm -hmm. what appeared in the newspaper or the dispatches that were registered over the radio. Okay. And how about uh, when Roosevelt died? It would have been the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because again, we depended solely on those two branches for information. Mm -hmm. How about when the war ended? When the war ended, all of the bells began to ring. And another young fellow and myself jumped on a bus and we went into Providence, which was the state capital, and we stayed there the whole afternoon just celebrating whatever that meant, making a lot of noise, I think, that's all it was. <laughs> we weren't old enough to drink. Mm. No one was going to let us into mm -hmm. any kind of establishment such as that. Now, was this uh, VE Day in May or VJ Day in August? VE Day okay. was the first one, and then in August, after the <clears throat> Japan capit capitulated, we did, I think, we went down to Pawtucket. We only went as far as Pawtucket on that occasion. But it was a similar, people just went wild mm -hmm. that, it, that it was all over. And do uh, you remember hearing about the dropping of the atomic bomb, which preceded these events? I don't honestly recall. Okay. So you're, in, uh, you're now in high school when the war ended? Yes. And you graduated in 1948. Yeah. So that was, uh, those t two years, two or three years were kind of a pivotal point in American history. Yes. What were you being taught about what was uh, taking place in the world? Well, when we graduated from high school in June of 1948, the class was required to learn the lyrics of a song, and I can remember this line from it, one world built on a firm foundation. And I think the second line was, one world looking, looking for peace, something like that. And there were only 98 people in our class, and then we graduated, we were seated on the stage, and the music teacher at the high school had us act as a chorus, and we sang that song. If you think back, that was the initiation of the United Nations. How about uh, when Berlin was being besieged and the general feeling of the United States toward the Soviet Union? Well, it did not, it did not take too long before you began to, began to be alert to the impending, if you will, conflict that might occur between former allies. And TV was coming into its own. 
in that period. And you began to see snippets of things mm -hmm. on the evening TV news. You just mentioned television. Uh, when did your family get its first TV? I can't remember the exact year. I can only, <laughs> I can only describe it as follows. The box was the size of a small refrigerator. The box. Okay. The screen was eight inches, I think eight or ten inches in the diagonal. And it was black and white. And you had rabbit ears that sat on the top and each of, each of the ears extended out about 30 inches and if you maneuver them the right way, you got a half decent picture. <laughs> and you probably got maybe four or five channels. Right. 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 So you graduated in 1948. Yeah. Were you going to be going to college? Right. And where were you heading? I went to Rhode Island College, which was located in Providence, Rhode Island. It began at the turn of the, tw the uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, strictly as a teacher preparation institution, and subsequently became a full-fledged liberal arts type institution. And what were you majoring in? English. And what was your ultimate goal? I wanted to be a teacher of English. Teacher of English it is. Let's go ahead now a couple of years okay. to the <coughs> Korean War. Yep. June of 1950. We were, uh, through TV, radio, etc., we were alerted to the incursion by the North Koreans into South Korea. We had been, we were aware of, you know, the conflict, the incipient conflict that existed there, all of the reasons for dividing that country into two parts. It had been held for almost a century by the Japanese as a colony. Mm -hmm. And after they lost the war, the, the Russians and the Americans decided, for whatever reason, well, we'll just split it in half at the 38th parallel. Okay. And, you, of course, you're, you're still in college. Right. Did you have any concerns that you might be called Well, in? we all had to register for the draft. Uh -huh. Number one, and when I entered my senior year in college, I said to myself, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to be grabbed and inducted. So why don't I go to the draft board and ask to be called up in a, in a specific month? So I went up to the city of Woonsocket, which is north of Cumberland, <coughs> Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and I appealed to the draft board to be called up in July, the month following my graduation from college, figuring I'd serve my time and probably be discharged in the summer of 1954 so I could go back to school. Well, actually, that's the way it worked out. <laughs> I graduated in May, end of May. I had a month at leisure. And then I was called up in early July of 1954, <coughs> reported to the draft board. We were taken to Providence, Rhode Island, to the Fields Point Induction Center, and we were put in a long line. There were scores of us. Mm -hmm. We were put in a long line, and the gentleman said, okay, count off. One, two, one, two. And all of the folks who had said two, were told to step out, and it was announced immediately, you're Marines. I was a one. That's the way the decision was made relative to which branch of the service you're going to serve in. No Navy, just Mar Army or Marines? Yep, Army and Marines. All right, you're in the Army now. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, let me have a, just a Go sip of right water ahead. We were put on a bus and we were taken to Fort Devens, and we were at Fort Devens for probably about 10 days, and we were given uniforms and we had physical examinations and et cetera. 
And then we were brought into Boston and put on a plane, and we were, a group of us were flown to Fort Knox in Kentucky. And I spent from close to the end of July until right before Christmas in 1952 at Fort Knox. I went through an eight-week basic training program, and following that, I was sent to a school, and I learned a whole lot of administrative activities, such as learning to type and various forms of the, uh, that the military use, etc. That was a, that was as a result of my not wanting to be a second lieutenant in the tank corps in the armored corps. <laughs> Uh, I was into, because I was a college graduate, they wanted me to go into the officer training program. I wanted to do my time and my service, come out and go back to school, and I did not see myself as spending, you know, a career in the military. So I passed mm -hmm. up that opportunity, and at the end, let's see, probably this, the second week in December we finished at Fort Knox. We had time off. Okay, I came home to Rhode Island, and the day after Christmas, I got on a train in Providence and went to LaGuardia Airport and flew out to Seattle, Washington. And in Seattle, Washington, we were housed first at Fort Lewis and then subsequently at the Naval Base and then we were put on the SS Simon Ballou, <coughs> which was a one-stack military transport. And we took the Great Circle route out of Seattle to Yokohama in early January, and it took 22 days for the ship to get there. It was mm -hmm. a brutal trip because of the weather. Yeah. Has anyone, if you've seen the uh, the television series uh, Deadly Catch. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you get an idea of what the ocean is like over on the Bering Straits. That was mm -hmm. what the ocean was like. Let's pause a little bit right here. Now, Joe, this was, was this the first time you've been away from the United States? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. And when you were going into basic and down at Fort Knox, was this the first time you had met people from other portions of the country? Jen, I think I would agree with that 100 percent, yes. Mm -hmm. And do you think you're, uh, up to this point, when you were put on a boat in a stomach-churning trip to Japan, uh, do you think your training uh, was adequate up to that point? Well, the basic, I, I, enjoyed, the basic, I enjoyed the basic training. Mm -hmm. I never had a problem doing the things we were required to do and marching and doing your exercises and keeping the barracks clean and learning to use a rifle. Mm -hmm. And we went through the bayonet practice and so on. I mean, you just, you learn to do what you were asked to do. I think that that's one of the most important things about having the opportunity to serve in the military. And that is, you learn to do what is asked of you. And you, and you do it without grumbling, mm -hmm. just do it. Let's get you back to Japan after uh, that aforementioned stomach churning trip. You're in Yokohama. What were you being told about uh, Japan at this point? We weren't being told anything. We were put on a train. There were 3,300 men on that ship. Wow. At the point in time when we were shipped over the United Nations forces were having very difficult times in Korea. And so, essentially, this group of people and others who were being shipped over at the same time were fillers for the infantry regiments that were serving in Korea. So we, we were brought to a replacement depot, and over the next week, persons were caught every, twice a day, they would bring out several hundred people into a large open field, and names would be called, and you would be told to step out, and you would be told to what you were being assigned. 7th Replacement Company, 7th Infantry Division, Korea, you know what that meant. 
gradually the numbers decreased. It got to the point where there were only a handful of us left. We're wondering, where are we going? I was called to an office and my fatigue clothes and the like were taken away from me and I was given a new dress uniform because when we got to the replacement depot, they took away all our dress clothes and gave us helmets, rifles, everything as if we're ready to go. All that's taken away from me. Now I'm dressed up in my dress mm -hmm. uniform. <clears throat> I was put in a Jeep and taken to an office. I was interviewed by a colonel. I've never forgotten. <laughs> I've never forgotten this particular experience because it's, it's just a make or break situation. He had whatever dossier they had for each of the soldiers in front of him. And finally he said to me, would you like to work for me, Keith? And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> I didn't say sir. Well, so I immediately apologized and he laughed. That man's name was Leland L. Prowitz. He was a colonel. He had been in the armored division, and coincidentally, in the Second World War with Patton. And he was one of those types who at times still wore the boots as if they were horseback, you know, old cavalry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was from Oregon. He, he was a very, very fine human being. And it was a delight to work for him for the next two years, which is what I did. I worked as a secretary to, in his office for the next two years. It was a, a uh, security office. We handled all kinds of secure materials, did clearances for uh, secret type people who were vetted mm -hmm. to do that type of thing. We handled all that paperwork. After the armistice in Korea, we also handled confidential papers on certain POWs who were being returned to the States and about whom there were some questions relative to their behavior in captivity. That was a very, that was a very quiet type of activity. So Joe, uh were you basically working nine to five for the colonel? Basically working nine to five, six days a week. And did you ever get any time off to enjoy Japan? Yes, I did. I would leave, if we weren't gonna work on Saturday, on Friday night I would get on a train and just ride somewhere. Get off, rent a bicycle, stay in a Japanese inn and drive around on the bike. I also had the opportunity, I ran into the Swedish truce team, members of the Swedish truce team from Korea. I climbed Mount Fuji with them. I had civilian clothes on, and everyone asked me if I were a member of that group, and I simply nodded my head, and I was as blonde as they were, so I passed. <laughs> what else do you remember about your time in Japan? I also had the opportunity to become very friendly with a young man, a former naval officer who worked in our office. And he took me to his family's home. His father was, I'm going to call him like a principal, we would call him a superintendent, of a small agricultural school. And several weekends during the time I was there, I spent a day and a night with them, sleeping on the floor, using the tatami, the little rice filled pillow. Mm -hmm. I had octopus one morning for breakfast, once, <laughs> just once. I, I had a, I really had a very fine experience there. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. And you were Let's indeed. It that way. Mm -hmm. I was very, very fortunate that for some reason my name was plucked out out of all of those people who were on that ship. I could just as easily have been one of the scores who went over to the 7th Regiment. Again, very lucky indeed. Yes. And you had a chance to see a bit of Japan in those immediate post-war years. 
Uh, did you see any damage or any? Yes. Yeah. Yokohama was literally a wasteland. It had been burned to the ground. Parts of Tokyo, you could see, were, had been rebuilt with temporary type buildings. But what was very interesting is there was no damage to the Imperial Palace and there was little or no damage to the section of the city containing all, pardon me, all of the Japanese government buildings. That's where MacArthur had his headquarters. Mm -hmm. Did you have a chance to visit uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki? No. But you did hear of them? Yes. Okay. We're now going to the end of your tour in 1954. Tell us what happened next. Well, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, the colonel made me an offer. He said, I can't send you home on an airplane, but how would you like to be a part of the advance party on a ship going back that will be carrying families back to the United States? And so I went on board that ship three or four days early down in Yokohama as they loaded it up and military families were being sent home. And I was responsible for creating the ship's newspaper, the banner, the banner, sorry, the Buckner Banner, that's it, the Buckner Banner. And we had a great cruise across well, the southern, most southern part of the Pacific Ocean. We went by Hawaii, we didn't stop there, but it was far different than the trip over. And we came into San Francisco at midnight, and everyone on the ship was on the deck. The bridge was lighted. Alcatraz was still in business. All the lights were on in Alcatraz. And everyone was cheering, and it was a great expression of gratitude that we were home. At the time you set back on American soil, what was your rank? I was a corporal. You were a corporal, okay. Yeah. And were you discharged on the West Coast? No. We then were put on an airplane that was unheated. We sat, we sat as we flew across country, first from, Stone, uh, first from uh, San Francisco to Cheyenne, Wyoming, mm -hmm. from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Chicago, from Chicago to Fort Dix. And we sat, we sat in steel bucket seats, and we sat with our winter, our winter long coats on. It was so cold. So, so that was a that was a memorable air, mm -hmm. air flight. Yeah. And uh, what time? What part of the year was this? July. And it was still very cold. Wow. <laughs> uh, in the airplane. True. So you were discharged in Fort Dix. Right. Did you receive any commendations or medals? Well, there's like a service medal and a mm -hmm. Korean War medal, that, which I was eligible. And after your time in the Army, did you join any veteran service organizations? No. Did you attend any reunions of former personnel? No. Okay. You're now back in Rhode Island, I take it? Right. Tell us what happened next. I was fortunate enough to immediately get a job as a teacher of English in the secondary school. And I worked there in Johnston, Rhode Island, which is a suburb of Providence, for two years. And I met the late uh, Gail Cosgrove, who was a vice president of the Birmingham State College. And he introduced me to Natick. And so I applied for a job here. I was introduced, I was interviewed rather, by the late John Lane on Good Friday in 1956 in his home here in Natick. And I went to work in September of 1956 in Natick at the Coolidge Junior High School. Wow. You came to Natick at a very interesting time. Yes. A baby boom was well underway. Right. As you know, my parents contributed mightily to it. 
So uh, tell us a little bit about Natick in the mid-50s. In the mid-50s, one did not have to leave downtown. Every shopping convenience was available. There were three grocery stores. You could pay your gas and electric bill in a building on the site of the public safety building today. What is now the site of the town hall, I'm sorry, what is now the site of the parking lot beside the town hall was the center school and that was the school administration building as well. There were very, very interesting stores here. There were two French based bakeries. There was a men's clothing store. There were four or five shoe stores. It was a thriving little community right downtown. Mm -hmm. And how long did you teach at Coolidge? I was a teacher at Coolidge until June of 1959, at which time I was promoted to be the first vice principal of the new Wilson Junior High School, which was, was built up on Rutledge Road. Tell us about Route 9 in the late 50s. Route 9, Route 9 in the late 50s was still known as the Worcester Turnpike, what is now the site of all of the shopping centers on the north side with the filter beds, which were open air drying places for sewage. Mm -hmm. And right off Route 9 on Speen Street, you had the drive-in movie theater. Mm -hmm. And at the junction of what was then Speen Street and Route 9, there was a big candy store in the southwest corner. Mm -hmm. And on the east corner, southeast mm -hmm. corner, you had a little motel, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. It was quite a different venue than we know today. Oh, definitely. And uh, if memory serves me right, wasn't the 927 mall built around the time you became vice principal? The 927. J.M. Fields. Yes. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. That was the first building on the site. All right. And how long were you at Wilson? I was at Wilson until 1964, mm -hmm. at which time Fred Maffio, who was then the superintendent of schools, said to me, you're going to be the principal of the new Kennedy Junior High School. Start attending the building committee meetings tonight. Hmm. That's, the way it was. That's the way it happened. And so I opened the Kennedy Junior High School in September of 1964 at Wilson with double sessions. Wilson went in the morning from 7.30 till noon. We started at 12.30 and went to 5 o'clock. Our football team practiced in the morning, and the teachers' meetings were all held at 11 o'clock in the morning. And then we had our day. We were there until April. On the Friday before the April vacation, the 800-plus kids signed at Kennedy. We placed on buses. And I had paper bags with handles on them into which they put their books. And we went to the Kennedy, which was only partially completed. There was no cafeteria. There was no auditorium. They were still working on it. But I wanted to get in there. And in those days, there was not the helicopter parent concerns that would be, have been expressed today about fumes and a variety of other things. So that's how we started Kennedy. And by the time the school opened the following September, the building was finished. That must have been pretty brutal, those double sessions. Not really. Really? But they were so different that everyone thrived on them. In fact, <clears throat> the faculty at Kennedy Junior High School put together a play entitled Pure as the Driven Snow, and it was presented on the stage at Wilson as a little fundraiser. 
Don't you wish they had a video camera then? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, you're now at a brand new Kennedy Junior High School, mid-60s. We're now getting into Vietnam, though. And what was the, the feeling around Kennedy as you were uh, assuming the principalship? Relative to that war? Yes. I don't think that the youngsters themselves knew that much about what was going on, to tell you the truth. I don't really do. There were no protests of any type and kind mm -hmm. that I recall mm -hmm. having happened. Right. Okay, so how long were you at Kennedy? I was at Kennedy from 64 until 1970. And in the fall of 1970, I left to become first the assistant superintendent in the city of Worcester. And I was the first central office administrator to have been brought in from the outside. <laughs> and in the meantime, did you get your doctorate? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. And how long were you in Worcester? I was in Worcester from 70 to 76. And I came back here to be the superintendent of schools in November of 1976. And how long were you superintendent? I was superintendent of schools through September of 1995. And then I was subsequently called back mm -hmm. a few years later when the gentleman who was the superintendent left at Christmas time. And so I served another seven months. Mm -hmm. So Joe, how important was it for you to serve in the military? I think it was very important for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I think it gave me a better understanding of an appreciation for the diversity of our population. And I was ignorant, to use that term, of who really lived in America. But having been sent to a facility in the South, I saw firsthand what it meant to be an African American in one of the Southern states at that point in time. And albeit, Kentucky was considered a border state during the Civil War. During my basic training, I was directed to bring a group of men to a barber shop. Now, there were no African-American children in Cumberland, Rhode Island, in the high school when I was there. And there, were a relative, there was a relatively small population of African-Americans in Providence at that point in time. I only recall one young man who was an African-American in the college with me. In any event, I marched a group of about eight or ten men into a barber shop. Three of them were African Americans. And when we entered the shop, the several barbers slammed their scissors down on the counters. And one of them said to me, get those men out of here. I did not realize, nor I had the sergeant who gave me the order told me, there were barber shops for Caucasians and barber shops for African Americans. Just as, and it was out of my ignorance, it didn't click that there were clubs for white soldiers and clubs for black soldiers, and they're like recreation centers. Mm -hmm. It never clicked when. I brought them to the barber shop, and I have never forgotten that. And it drove home an example, in my mind at least, of the injustice that the American black person and other minorities still suffer from. Granted, we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. But you can still see it happening in the South today 
with the voter registration suppression and other activities of that nature. And I apologize if that sounds political, oh. but it is a, a very important point of view on my part. It's quite understandable, uh, given your experiences. And Joe, how do you, uh, what's your overall opinion of the U.S. military today? Well, we've never had a more experienced and highly trained group of professionals because since we do not depend upon a draft, the men and women who serve are in every sense of the word professionals. They volunteer, they are giving of themselves just as you are a person involved with news and reporting and my life has been part of education. They are professionals in every sense mm -hmm. of the word. And certainly, if you look back over the last decade and the stress under which our military has been placed with the various conflicts, you can certainly look at that group of people and say to them, well, without them, who? Did any of your children or grandchildren express interest in the military? Well, being all, all women, <laughs> no, the answer was no. No, one ended, up, one ended up being a banker, another is a psychiatric nurse, and the, and the third one is a professional teacher. Had the opportunities presented themselves back then, do you think uh, your daughters would have at least expressed some interest? I'm not certain. Okay. I'm not okay. sure. And aside from your uh, career as a superintendent, you've also been very uh, much involved in the Morris Institute Library. Yes. How long have you been a trustee? I've been a trustee since 1990, which is 26 mm -hmm. years. And any other organizations? Yes, I've been a member of the Natick Rotary Club for 40 years. I have been a member of the Institutional Review Board of the Metro West Medical Center since 1994. I am a lay person who serves on a board that reviews all of the experiments on human subjects that are conducted there and at other tenant hospitals. My interest is in what is known as informed consent. Do you, as a volunteer for this experiment, truly know what it means to be a volunteer, what the consequences are in every, in every way, shape, and form. Okay. Joe, is there anything else before we wrap up this interview? Yes. One, of the, one of the great things that service allowed me were the benefits of the Korean GI Bill, which was not as rich as the World War II GI Bill, but certainly it gave me the opportunity to take courses at Boston University and Rhode Island College and at the NYU. And most of it was paid for by the monthly check that you would receive as long as you were enrolled. That, and, was, a great, mm -hmm. that was a great gift. Right. And did you, have you also done um, any programs to uh, VA hospital? No, no, I haven't, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything else? No, I think okay. we've covered a lot of territory in Oh, definitely. Time. Well, Dr. Joseph Keefe, we thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Well, I thank you, Maureen. It's been a joy. And I thank the young man who's serving here as our uh -huh. cinematographer. <laughs> okay.